Well, thank you, uh, Frank, for the opportunity to be here this morning, and thank you all uh, for attending. As a student of nephrology, I remember standing at the bedside of my father. He would undergo chronic dialysis treatments for over 10 years. At every session, he would sit there either on his chair or on his bed. His arm would be extended. Blood would come out from him, go into this machine. And as a student, I was wondering what was going on in that machine. But nevertheless, the blood would then be returned back to him. That machine, in some way, kept him alive for 10 years. He was able to attend our wedding. He was able to dance a clumsy foxtrot with my wife. He was able to be at the births of his three grandchildren and was able to be at many of their birthdays. What were the origins of removal strategies and how did we actually get uh, to this point? It fascinated me as a student to think about this that machine in some way kept him alive, gave him a quality of life for over 10 years. Well, it has an interesting history, of course. If you had a fever in ancient Egypt or had a headache or abdominal pain at the time of Hippocrates or Galen, you would have been prescribed a course of bloodletting. You would have undergone a series of bloodletting primarily because the prevalent thinking at the time was that disease or illness was, in fact, because you had too much of bad humors in your blood and not enough good humors in your blood, and that bloodletting, nevertheless, would allow the bad humors to go away and the good humors to come back. A rather crude, but nevertheless simple thinking about disease. This is a painting by a famous Dutch artist by the name of Jans Horeman from the 17th century. You see a woman here who's ill. She's sitting on a chair. Her arm is extended. And the surgeon is holding a lancet. He's cut into a vein. And blood is dripping from her arm into a pan. The pan is being held by a young boy. The evil humors were being removed. Now, of course, in the spirit of nephrology, next to her is a nephrologist to be, I would imagine, holding a jug of urine, also thinking about what to do next. This was the therapy of choice, in fact, for over two, three, if not longer, hundred years. Bloodletting, nevertheless, was a very crude intervention. On the one hand, repeated bloodletting would lead to anemia or weakness and fatigue. On the other hand, with significant bloodletting, as you can imagine, it would lead to circulatory and hemodynamic shock. But this was the therapy of choice, as I said, for quite uh, a long time. The medical journal, The Lancet, in fact, started in the 1820s, was named after that very specific tool used by physicians and surgeons, The Lancet, the tool that allows you to cut into the blood vessel. Books were published, as you can see, on the types of different lancets that could be used, and in fact, even ways to hold um, the particular uh, lancet. Well, we can fast forward to the early 1900s. We gained a better understanding of what, in fact, what was in blood. Blood was just not this uniform solution. Louis Pasteur said, well, it's not all of blood. There are pathogens in blood, for example, that cause disease. We also began to appreciate that the blood consisted of cells, white cells, red cells, platelets. It consisted of metabolites, diffusible substances, urea, sodium, potassium, and so forth. The predecessors of nephrology realized that rather than take out whole blood, maybe we could tinker with blood and only take out what was bad and leave in what was good, one of the predecessors here being Abel, if you see the picture here. This was in the early 1900s, well before anything like this had ever been uh, described. This is a publication from 1914, Abel demonstrating removal of plasma with the return of cells, only taking out what was bad, 
leaving in what was good. Another publication also by Abel, removal of diffusible substances from circulating blood, a method called dialysis. This was over 100 years ago. This was the backdrop of my training, the predecessors before me. I became comfortable as a trainee now of nephrology with words like volume of distribution, protein binding, convection, rebound. Yes, those words, of course, made me part of the cognoscenti of nephrology, but these were words we acted on every day. We used them in our management strategies. We made critical decisions, of course, of our patients. Now, as an early nephrologist in an academic environment in Boston, we were forced to make decisions about what areas of research we would like to pursue, because it wasn't enough, at least not where I came from, to be an amazing clinician, although I would have been perfectly happy with that. So I decided to study high blood pressure, and in particular, study high blood pressure in women, a rather understudied area. Differences between men and women, and when blood pressure started to go up in women, when does coronary disease and heart disease become more prevalent in women? That was the area of my research, and I worked in large databases and epidemiologic studies. I remember one day receiving a call from my cousin. She was 30 weeks of gestation. She had swelling in her feet. She called me in a panic because at such an early stage of her pregnancy, she said, I was given the diagnosis of preeclampsia. She had protein in her urine and was told that kidney failure was imminent. It was the very first time as a nephrologist, I realized that a common medical complication of pregnancy was intimately tied to the kidney. In fact, part of the definition of preeclampsia included kidney disease. So, what is preeclampsia, and why should we care as nephrologists about this particular condition? Preeclampsia is a condition unique to pregnancy. It begins with the placenta, a sick placenta, unfortunately. Factors released from the placenta go into the mother's circulation. It's important to remember that in preeclampsia, these factors circulate in mother's blood, but they do not get through the placenta and into the fetus. These factors that circulate in mother's blood travel through the blood system to various organ beds, and there they injure endothelial cells, those cells that line the blood vessels. Endothelial cell injury to blood vessels in general can cause significant hypertension. It's not uncommon that women with preeclampsia are on one, two, or more blood pressure medicines. When blood pressure medicines don't work, a woman can suffer a stroke and seizures. And as you can imagine, as blood pressure starts to go up and it becomes more difficult to control, the obstetrician tries to terminate the pregnancy. Endothelial damage to the kidney leads to protein in the urine, kidney failure, swelling, significant edema, a hallmark, a characteristic again, of preeclampsia. Endothelial cell injury of the brain and blood vessels in the brain lead to brain swelling. It's not uncommon a woman might come in and say that she has a visual changes. It's a common question that we would ask her. That would be mild because at an extreme, damage to the brain would lead to seizures and death. And endothelial cell injury of the liver leads to acute liver failure and a syndrome called HELP, or hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. It's a devastating condition, and one where the kidney is intimately involved. Now, if the disease emanates from the placenta, then by definition, removing the placenta would be the treatment of the disease. That, of course, would terminate the pregnancy. That's not a problem if a woman is undergoing routine prenatal care and she has mild symptoms and she's at the end of her pregnancy. She's at term. The fetus is mature. 
you deliver the placenta, you terminate the pregnancy, the baby does fine. Preeclampsia becomes a major problem where one, if she doesn't receive prenatal care so that we can identify that she's at risk, and two, when it happens preterm. If a woman gets preeclampsia at 25, 28 weeks of gestation, the fetus is hardly ready, of course, to be delivered. The fetus does not have lungs that are mature enough to breathe on her own, requiring ventilatory support. The eyes haven't fully developed. The brain may bleed if she's delivered early. So preterm preeclampsia is really the major challenge. And in this context, every day, every week, every month that the pregnancy can be extended, the fetus does better. The fetus doesn't just suffer from complications, remember, during birth and at the time of hospitalization. These consequences actually can go on for life. Learning disability, asthma, cerebral palsy. These things all last in women and men, babies, that are born prematurely. So, what's happening in preeclampsia at the cellular level? This is the picture of an electron micrograph on your left. The top left shows a glomerulus with capillary loops. You see open white spaces. These white spaces are the areas where the blood cells traverse. The capillary loops actually have endothelial cells in them, but you can hardly see them. They're plastered and they're flat up against the wall of the capillaries. You know they're there because of the nuclei that protrude into those white spaces. In contrast, in preeclampsia, the endothelial cells are damaged, they're injured, they're swollen, and they close off the capillary loops, as shown in the bottom electron micrograph. What's going on at the molecular level? My research partner, Anand Karmanchi, in Boston, began to study factors released from the placenta, asking the question, which factors released from the placenta would injure endothelial cells and carry necessarily the hallmarks of this particular condition? Through a number of different experiments, he unraveled this potential mechanism. First, on the top cartoon, you see the endothelial cells in yellow. They're flat. These are fenestrated endothelial cells. They have what they call windows in between them. Those are the lines. These cells have receptors for growth factors, specifically vascular endothelial growth factor. VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor, shown in blue, binds those receptors. It keeps those cells healthy, happy. In contrast, factors released from the placenta block VEGF from binding its receptor. In this condition, in the absence of VEGF signaling, the receptors are unhappy, the cells swell, and the organs are damaged. That is at least one mechanism we believe to play a critical role in this particular condition. With this understanding, the question is, what do we do next? First, let me highlight for you how big of a problem preeclampsia is. Maternal mortality around the world has actually gone down in most developed countries. In almost every developed country, unfortunately, other than in the United States, death during pregnancy has actually gone up. In fact, the rates of death during pregnancy in this country have actually gone up to the point of being five times higher than our peer developed countries. African American women have rates that are even higher than what I'm showing you here, for reasons that we have yet to understand. The most common reasons why women die in pregnancy, that most extreme, horribly unfortunate outcome, are bleeding, hemorrhage, blood clots, thromboembolism, and hypertensive disorders, preeclampsia. Those three make up the top three reasons why women die in pregnancy all over the world in both developed and developing countries. Now, Mother Nature designed the placenta to give to the fetus all 
that is good. Millions of years of evolution went into the design of this most efficient transport mechanism. Transporting from the mother circulation to the fetal circulation, nutrients, oxygen, antibodies, all critical to keeping the fetus alive, growing, and healthy. That critical system, unfortunately, serves as our major obstacle to developing a treatment. Imagine if we gave something to a woman to target this particular pathway, small molecule or antibody. By definition, if the disease stayed in the mother, we would hopefully help her. But we had this efficient system to transport whatever we would give her to the fetus. The fetus is not suffering from preeclampsia. These factors don't traverse the placenta. The placenta, interestingly enough, is protecting the fetus from this condition. But any small molecule or antibody we would give to her by definition would potentially traverse the placenta and cause, and have the potential to cause, an adverse effect in the fetus. So, how could we design a therapy that was safe for the mother and, importantly, safe for the baby? How could I fight millions of years of evolution, fight Mother Nature? After all, she was a mother herself. So, we debated this for many years, I would say. One fine day in Boston, my colleague and I decided to park ourselves at a bookstore, Borders Bookstore. We parked ourselves, ourselves in the cafe. It was the middle of winter, a blizzard outside. It was easy to park yourself in a bookstore, I guess. And we said to ourselves, we're not going to leave here until we figured out a way to tackle this particular condition. For about three hours, we wrestled with different options for treatment. Small molecule, antibody, siRNA, gene therapies. We came up with all sorts of solutions, all of them incredibly attractive. All of them had the potential, of course, to help the mother, but all of them had the potential to cross the placenta and potentially harm the baby. Finally, after sort of this cognitive wrestling match, I asked my colleague, I said, if I gave you a, 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 a bucket of blood or a pint of blood from a woman with preeclampsia, with these factors elevated, how would you isolate that? And he said that was rather simple. The protein circulates with a very strong positive charge. It has an isoelectric point of close to 10. That means that physiologic pH, it's very positively charged. And in the laboratory, the way to isolate this protein is you use a negatively charged column. It's simple pluses and minuses, fundamentals of chemistry. That's what he did routinely in the laboratory. Well, immediately, we're both nephrologists. And we realized that if we could isolate this protein using a charge-based column in the laboratory, could we not use the same in the clinic? Negatively charged columns actually existed in the clinic. We used routinely negatively charged columns to isolate proteins such as LDL. The condition familial hypercholesterolemia is a condition that doesn't respond well to statins, and because of a genetic defect, often with the LDL receptor, LDL levels are incredibly high. The only way individuals can live without developing a heart attack with this genetic condition and live to their 50s, 60s, is, a, is to undergo phoresis treatments on a weekly or biweekly basis. LDL bound to apolipoprotein B turns out to be positively charged. And you can use negatively charged columns as one mechanism, there are other mechanisms, to remove this protein of interest. So we said, well, these kinds of columns are used clinically. Could we not use this as a removal strategy for this particular condition? There was one other important piece of information. Men and women are affected by familial hypercholesterolemia. Women with this condition also undergo phoresis, of course, to reduce the levels of LDL. And there had been reports at the time of women with FH who were able to successfully become pregnant and carry a pregnancy to term. And this gave us confidence that repeated 
apheresis, using a charge column at least, would potentially be safe. So that was, again, the backdrop and at least our hypothetical thinking. Positively charged protein, negatively charged column. As nephrologists, we enjoy dissecting the kinds of things we'd like to remove. So here's a quick dissection of the protein of interest. This is the soluble receptor, again, that binds VEGF in circulation. This particular protein, as I mentioned, circulates with a very strong positive charge. In one particular area of this protein, I show you the crystal structure. I've highlighted in blue the amino acids, lysine, arginine, histidine. These particular amino acids are positively charged. They adorn this particular protein like ornaments on a Christmas tree and give this protein a very strong positive charge in circulation. So, as nephrologists, we exploit characteristics of the protein of interest. Could we not imagine a system where a woman's blood containing good and bad factors, bad, obviously the ones we'd like to remove, circulating this blood through a circuit, a negatively charged circuit in particular, and removing the positively charged protein of interest. Now, the problem with this is, of course, there are other proteins that are positively charged in circulation. Fortunately, not many. Albumin is not one of them. But so, this can be considered a semi-selective method of removal. So remember, the negatively charged columns had already been in the clinic, so at least we could do a proof of concept with this particular strategy. But technologies have greatly advanced. We can now actually develop antibodies that specifically target this protein of interest. Only this protein, with a very high affinity. Now, just to step back, the placenta contains an incredibly efficient mechanism to transport antibodies from mother circulation to fetal circulation. So if we administered this antibody that targeted this protein, there would be no question this would be transported to the fetus. And remember, the fetus isn't suffering from preeclampsia. The mother is. And what we would not want to have happen is the antibody having an adverse effect in the fetus. So we can take that antibody, exploit the affinity, make sure it doesn't let go of that protein, and then anchor that antibody to a column. Anchor it so tightly that it doesn't detach at any point in a, in a treatment. We take that antibody, put that on a column, run her blood now through this column. And only the protein of interest, of course, is removed. Taking out what is bad and leaving in her, of course, what is good. That was our thinking, of course, at the time. So we did many early experiments. We did early experiments with small animals and large animals. We looked at many different kinds of columns to ask the question, which one would efficiently remove the protein of interest? One of the challenges in preeclampsia is that there are no good animal models. This particular condition primarily happens in humans. So how do we understand this disease and begin to test different therapies without an animal model? Well, nephrologists, interestingly enough, in Australia had created an animal model artificially, clamping off uterine artery of a baboon, leaving the uterus and the placenta mildly ischemic, and baboon soluble flit actually goes up. Baboons in that artificial model develop high blood pressure, proteinuria, the characteristics of preeclampsia. So, as you can imagine, with that model in hand, we began to test a variety of different treatments, not only, of course, for safety, but also for efficacy. In one particular experiment we did in Boston, which I show you the picture of here, this was an experiment we did with Linda and Rame, two amazing women who said, why not take a pint of blood, spike that pint of blood with a protein of interest and run it through series of columns and just ask which one would efficiently remove the protein of interest. And in one particular experiment, all 
in a laboratory. We took blood, spiked it with a protein of interest, and passed it successively each time through these columns and found that some efficiently removed the protein and some did not. That, of course, gave us a clue as to which kinds of columns we would target. We decided now to carry this forward to clinical studies. The problem is that we couldn't figure out which women to treat and which women not to treat. Preeclampsia is a condition primarily characterized and defined by clinical criteria. Fortunately, my colleague and I developed diagnostic tests, tests that actually identified proteins that are high and proteins that are low in this particular condition. The same soluble VEGF receptor, soluble FLT1, can actually be measured in blood as a diagnostic test. It's not available in the United States. It's available, however, in Europe. So we had to do our early studies in Europe because we could then treat women who had high levels, and we, of course, could then watch those levels come down, determine, of course, efficacy and safety. So let me fast forward. We've treated over two dozen women to date. We've treated them with charge-based columns as well as with antibody-based columns. We've treated women once. We've treated women more than once. We've treated them for several weeks. We have tried to understand the optimal dose. And of course, in our business, dose is a function of duration. How long do we treat her? And frequency. How many weeks can we treat her? In some women, we actually were able to treat them for three to four weeks, treating her once or twice a week for up to that time. We had to figure out issues of access. The last thing we wanted to do was think about a central access in a woman who was incredibly sick and having to worry about putting that in and the consequences thereof. Women with severe preeclampsia happen to be intravascularly volume depleted. They don't tolerate large blood flows out like we're used to in dialysis. So we actually could get by with a peripheral access and all the treatments we did to date have actually involved a peripheral and not a central access with flow rates of 50 or 60 mils uh, a minute. Anticoagulation, without it, we could not do extracorporeal treatments. So which one would we use? Heparin is the most common one and we immediately went to heparin, but here's the problem. Again, just going back to general chemistry. Heparin is a negatively charged molecule, compound. It, with a negative charge, binding to the positively charged protein of our interest, is good on the one hand, but the problem with that is that if it covers over the positive charges that I showed you, then our protein would not bind the column. And heparin with a very short half-life, if given at the wrong time, would prevent the protein from binding the column, only then to return back to the mother's circulation. So we opted for minimal heparin and, of course, some citrate, but then, of course, had to deal with the calcium issues, which are certainly manageable. We worked out issues of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. How much could we reduce this protein? Now, one thing to remember about the protein is that soluble FLIT, or the soluble VEGF receptor, is a normal protein of pregnancy. Why it's there, we can debate. It's a normal protein of pregnancy. And we have so much experience in nephrology that when we try to normalize proteins like hemoglobin or other things in, 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 in disease, we run into trouble. So our goal was not to necessarily bring the levels to normal, that normal level that we would see in normal pregnancy, but to bring it slightly down so that we could quell the symptoms and signs of this condition. So that her hypertension or her kidney disease or her liver disease would not get too severe, allowing the obstetrician, again, to carry the pregnancy forward. While we did these treatments, we tried to figure out, do the treatments allow blood pressure to be controlled? Does proteinuria get better? And in fact, in many cases, they did, as we tried to optimize, of course, the dose. So the next steps, of course, moving forward, is to better understand efficacy and safety. 
is to perform randomized trials, first in Europe because the diagnostic test is available, and then hopefully in the United States as we become, as those diagnostic tests become available in the United States. So that's what we're going to do hopefully in the next months and years to come. So I find myself at the bedside again, this time with a sick woman with severe preterm preeclampsia, together with our obstetrical colleagues. Just imagine the obstetrician at 25 weeks of gestation thinking about a woman with mild symptoms and debating this issue, should you let pregnancy continue so that the fetus matures, or do you terminate the pregnancy because literally Within 24 hours of mild symptoms, a woman can come in with a mild headache and within 24 hours have a stroke and die. That's how fast this disease can progress. It's an obstetrical and what I believe a nephrologic emergency. Well, nephrologists, of course, have been pioneers in removal strategies. We've been pioneers in selective removal strategies is something that we take pride in. We can intersect that skill set together with the technologies available and begin to address diseases. Diseases not just ones that are begging for a solution, but ones where in fact a removal strategy may be our safest option. Preeclampsia, I believe, of course, is one of those conditions. It's an important and unfortunate cause of maternal morbidity and mortality. And my hope, of course, in the years to come, together with our obstetrics colleagues, hand in hand with them, to be able to provide a solution for mothers, for babies, to reduce the mortality and morbidity of this condition. Thank you very much. I think there's time, Frank, for questions. Bob. <clears throat> Thank you. That, that, this is fascinating uh, and offers some hope in an area where uh, I must admit in my clinical career, anytime I got a consultation page from an obstetrician, um, I was terrified and they were terrified. Uh, um, as, you, as you're thinking ahead a little bit, do you have some sense of what the FDA um, may ask you to demonstrate from a clinical standpoint uh, for this, uh, this therapeutic intervention. Great, thanks for the question, Bob. We've had multiple meetings with the regulatory agencies from the very beginning, trying to ask the question and understand their standpoint in terms of what would we need to meet by way of a threshold for success. There's no question that the disease is worse and our therapy should be targeted first and foremost to women with preterm preeclampsia for the reasons that I mentioned. The second point, of course, is can we deliver a treatment that allows pregnancy to be prolonged? Importantly, prolonging pregnancy is one thing, but demonstrating that there's no adverse consequences to the fetus and then the neonate, and also identifying that the fetus is growing. It's one thing to say that you can prolong pregnancy, but again, if the fetus is not benefiting, that's a challenge. So the regulatory agencies in Europe, as well as in the United States, have all come to the primary endpoint in the same way, and that is an extension of pregnancy. It turns out in preeclampsia, if you wait and watch, which is the standard of care, you can probably, with severe preeclampsia, extend pregnancy by a week or so. And so the benchmark that they've given us is two weeks and beyond. We've seen early signal of that, but again, we haven't demonstrated that in a randomized trial. Dugan? We're taking some questions online, Ravi. So um, one question is, how much S-split needs to be removed? How do you determine the dose? Right, great question. So let me just put something in perspective. Um, if none of you are pregnant in the audience, then your normal levels of soluble FLT, man or woman, are about 20 picograms. That's 20 times 10 to the negative 12. If anyone is pregnant in this audience, and you're at 25, 28 weeks of pregnancy, the normal levels are 2,000 picograms per mil. That's normal. That's 100-fold higher than non-pregnant. If anyone has preeclampsia in this audience, 
One, you probably shouldn't be in this audience. <laughs> but two, the levels are 20,000 picograms per mil. So we're dealing with a condition where preeclampsia women have levels of 20,000, a thousandfold higher than normal, right? Ten times higher than normal pregnancy even. And if normal pregnancy is 2,000, our goal has been not to bring the levels down to 2,000, but maybe 10,000 or 8,000. That's been our thinking because our worry is if we bring it too close to normal, it's high for a reason, probably reasons we don't understand fully. And what we've seen with 20, 30% reduction levels is we've seen blood pressure so far has been controlled. In other words, we don't need more blood pressure medicines. We've seen proteinuria go down and we've seen a margin of safety that's acceptable. In other words, the fetus is growing. Now, I don't know if that ultimately will be the optimal dose, and we're certainly at the stage of trying to understand the dose better, but that's about the range that we'd like to see with these therapies. I think there's a question in front from Dr. Kalantar. Thank you. As usual, it was uh, excellent and highly educational presentation. I learned a lot. Um, uh, looking at uh, the uh, patients I currently have, these are dialysis patients. These last few months, we had two dialysis, two pregnant dialysis patients in our um, FMC uh, dialysis center of Orange. And one of them <coughs> was on the daily dialysis for 20, for two and a half months, and sadly, it was not successful after that uh, 26 of uh, pregnancy. And the other one has been now in Dallas for five months, uh, 33 weeker, and was just admitted to the hospital yesterday, two days ago, for high blood pressure. I was wondering uh, if, if there are different uh, uh, angles about a pregnant Dallas patients and in terms of the levels that you discuss, and if I measure them, what am I going to see and what should I do? And if there is anything in that regard, thank yeah, you. Great, thanks for the question, Cam. So let me make a few points uh, to highlight some of the comments uh, and questions that Cam had. First, in fact, we're seeing fertility rates on dialysis actually improve with better and more efficient dialysis. That's actually the good news. We're actually seeing on a large scale basis, women who are receiving dialysis go closer to term. They often don't get to term but they are getting closer to term. And we've seen that trend over the last several years. So as nephrologists, I believe we're doing a terrific job of not only improving fertility, but allowing women to get closer to term. Live births, if you look at that as a denominator, has actually gone up in dialysis patients. The question then is about high blood pressure, as you mentioned, and potentially a complication like preeclampsia. It's well known that you need a normal kidney for a normal pregnancy. If you all remember that the GFRs in pregnancy go up 50%, that, that, that kidney has to work really well to keep that pregnancy healthy. So in dialysis, what we see is higher rates of preeclampsia, obviously because of a non-functioning or poorly, poorly functioning kidney. The challenge in dialysis is, are these women at risk for preeclampsia? Absolutely, the challenge is diagnosing the condition. People think that preeclampsia is a condition simply of high blood pressure. That is, if we give blood pressure medicines, we can treat this condition. But I hope you saw from this presentation that this is not just a blood pressure problem. It's one of the problems, and we can manage that with blood pressure medications, sometimes not well. But this is a disease that manifests itself in many different organ systems, the brain, the heart, and so forth. So when you have a woman on dialysis who's at risk for preeclampsia, High blood pressure may be one manifestation, and we can use antihypertensive therapies, aggressive dialysis, but we can't forget that the brain, the heart, the liver, all of these other organs are also at risk. Antihypertensive therapies do not reduce the risk of preeclampsia. There have been many trials in this particular space. So the challenge for us is when she presents with hypertension, does she have underlying preeclampsia? We don't have a diagnostic test in the United States, but we can look at liver function tests, right? We can look at and look at her symptoms and signs and better understand. We can look at a number of other parameters, LDH, platelet count, and so forth, to give us a better understanding. Unfortunately, today, in this country, for a woman like her at 33 weeks with blood pressure perhaps going up, 
if she has any evidence of preeclampsia, the debate again will be the conundrum that I shared with you here, which is do you terminate the pregnancy or not? Fortunately, you're going to be giving her good care together with your obstetrician. And really, the, the, the close watch at this moment is the best thing we can do. First of all, Ravi, thanks so much for giving us this particular um, part of the story on preeclampsia, because I know it's not completed yet. Um, I would certainly invite anybody online to uh, likewise send other questions in if you have them. Uh, but the question I have is, can you speak to a little bit about the burden of preeclampsia as one of those top three comorbid and serious illnesses in pregnancy? And then secondarily, what do you see as the potential timeline for your clinical trial program to move forward, uh, potentially finding a therapy that that has great promise. Great, thank you, Frank. So the estimates uh, published in books and in articles of the frequency of preeclampsia somewhere between three and 10%, on average about 5% worldwide. It affects women in all countries of all races. So if you just do the math in the United States with just about 4 million pregnancies, although that seems to be changing as well, at a 5% rate, we're looking at about 200,000 women a year in this country developing preeclampsia. Now, fortunately, most of that preeclampsia is not preterm. Most of that is at term. And as I mentioned, the therapy would be termination of the pregnancy at that time. Unfortunately, about 20 to 30,000 women a year in this country have severe preterm. And that's the area and that's the focus, if you can imagine, for, uh, for the treatment. So that frequency of 5% in general is used and about a third of those patients have severe preterm, making them, for example, the, the eligible for trials as well as uh, the therapies that we've offered. As far as the next steps, I'd love to say to you we're going to be there soon. I will say we're going to be there soon. And how soon is that? You see, as you and I have discussed many times, it's not as if pharmaceutical companies are jumping on this bandwagon of developing treatments for women during pregnancy. In fact, it's rather unfortunate because it's the one area that biotech and pharmaceutical companies want to completely avoid. I've gone to so many presentations asking companies to help us, regulatory science and so forth, and they all say really great biology, fascinating, but most of the time they're looking for the exit sign to leave the room. The last thing they want is the litigation of dealing with the mother and baby, helping the mother, harming the baby, harming the mother, harming the baby, and so forth. So we've had to cobble together, as you and I have talked about, an academic really strength in this and move this forward. Now, fortunately, we have some help from industry, devices, our diagnostic test, and that's helped us quite a bit. I will say that the antibody-based column is now in the clinic. We've treated five women, and we're looking forward to treating more. This is in the UK. The charge-based columns have already been studied and tested in Europe, and hopefully next year they'll come to the United States. So the nephrology community, which is critical, in my opinion, for this particular disease, is going to be front and center for these studies, and they're all going to be rolling out, I would say, in the next year. Great. Thank you very much.